Well, you, a summit between U.S. President Donald Trump and the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un broke down after their long-awaited talks ended with no agreement. The failure came after the U.S. refused North Korea's demand for the removal of the economic sanctions it's imposed on the Asian country. The inconclusive summit is a setback for Trump as his administration has been trying to signify the rapprochement gamble with Pyongyang as a, a momentous policy achievement. Even as the White House insisted the talks were productive, the two sides failed to produce even a joint statement. This says Trump conceded that U.S. and North Korean officials were at odds about the precise definition of denuclearization, which is the goal that he's trying to achieve without giving any concessions uh, to Kim. Why the much-touted talks failed? Are they a setback for Trump? These are some of the questions that we will be discussing in tonight's debate. But before that, let's go to Seoul and talk to Press TV's correspondent Frank Smith about the outcome of the summit. Frank, were you surprised by the way the talks ended in Hanoi? Well, I was surprised. A lot of experts that I talked to, they suggested that Trump was looking for that photo op, that victory that he could take back to the United States while he's undergoing such uh, intensive difficulties with the U.S. Congress. But there were indications early on that, that there were going to be some problems at this summit. Just early this week, they were still setting the agenda with uh, advanced teams from the, from the U.S. State Department negotiating with North Korea over what was going to be discussed at this summit. And then we had these tremendous expectations that were brought about by the kind of optimism developed in the first summit, but without those details. So especially here in South Korea, they were looking for some details in this summit. And of course, nothing of the sort came out of it. Some of the things that the Moon Jae-in administration was looking for here were, you know, uh, perhaps an end of war declaration, perhaps a, a movement toward a peace treaty. And then you have the inter-Korean projects that, that South Korea wants to restart at the uh, Gumgang Tourism Resort inside North Korea at a, at a well-known tourist mountain. And then you have uh, the Gaesong Industrial Complex, a joint in industrial complex inside North Korea that both South Korea and North Korea wanted to restart. Those were all shelved, not discussed, while the U.S. pressured North Korea to move toward complete denuclearization without receiving any corresponding measures. Uh, North Korea has suspended its nuclear and missile testing since late in 2017, and since that time, it's received, again, no corresponding measures from the United States. North Korea specifically is looking for a drawdown of the United Nations Security Council sanctions that have been ongoing despite, again, North Korea's suspension of its nuclear and missile development. The, the suspension of those sanctions, relief from the United Nations sanctions, is supported by many countries around the world, including especially two United Nations Security Council members, China and Russia, as well as U.S. ally here, South Korea. So it really is perplexing to hear the U.S. say that, you know, they couldn't get past even some of the further measures that that North Korea was offering and provide some some sanctions relief here. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Frank Press TV's Frank Smith joining us from Seoul. And on tonight's debate, we have publisher and editor of Politics First, Mr. Marcus Papadopoulos joining us from London, and also writer and analyst Charles Ortel is joining us from New York. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Let's start off with Mr. Papadopoulos in London. President Trump now has to go home without securing his much touted deal with North Korea, why do you think the talks failed? On the contrary, I'm of the opinion that the meeting was a success. The fact that Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, whose respective countries have harbored bitter feelings towards each other for more than half a century, have met for a, sec for a second time, is something to rejoice about because now that Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un and their respective administrations are speaking with each other, this on its own has resulted in a reduction of tension on the Korean peninsula. It wasn't so long ago that there were warlike words coming from Washington and Pyongyang, 
But now that Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un have met each other, not just once, but twice, is something that should be celebrated. As I said, the tension on the Korean Peninsula has been much reduced because of these meetings. And the people who are labelling this second meeting as a failure are the men and women who work for mainstream media in America and in Britain, such as CNN, Fox News, The Times and The Guardian. And these people are simple-minded people who offer simple-minded analysis. They do not understand the complexities of international relations. The expectations of these people were wholly unrealistic to think that after a second meeting there would be a breakthrough, even a major breakthrough, was just ludicrous. It was absolutely ridiculous. It is, if there is to be a breakthrough in relations between Washington and Pyongyang, it is going to happen after a very long period of time. It is not going to happen after the second meeting, the third meeting, the fourth meeting. No, it will happen over a long period of time. Nonetheless, as I said moments ago, the fact that they are now talking to each other, the fact that there is communication, there is dialogue, has meant that the tension on the Korean Peninsula is much reduced and there are no more warlike comments coming from the American government and the North Korean government. That is something that we should rejoice. Let's bring in Mr. Ortel from New York. Mr. Ortel, our guest in London believes that regardless of how uh, the uh, summit ended, uh, it was a success. So what do you think? Well, who says people from the opposite ends of the political spectrum can't find issues to agree upon? <laughs> I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, my distinguished colleague. I think that um, the, the situation in relations, developing relations between North Korea and the United States of America is enormously complex. We need to remember that there are constituencies in both countries that uh, benefit from continuing tensions and, and uh, military drama, especially in North Korea. I mean, what is going to happen to the vast military complex in North Korea once a peace is forged, a lasting peace is forged between North and South and involving the United States and our allies? What happens to that military machine over there? A, a lot of people have to be wondering about that. So I think it is a good, a, a good step, frankly. I think it's good for uh, people to understand when they go into negotiations what they want and where, when they'll walk away. Um, I think it's constructive. The people of North Korea, at least the negotiating team, has been offered a vision of what could happen in, in peace and economic prosperity. I think people will start thinking deeply about that. Now uh, the, the leader has seen Singapore firsthand, which after all several decades ago was a fishing village. Uh, now is the marvel, marvel of the world. Uh, they've seen Vietnam. They've seen how a country that was at war with the United States could, after a period of time, uh, enter into productive relations with the United States. So uh, I'm hopeful that uh, a after this second summit, there'll be more summits, and eventually there will be a lasting peace. Mr. Papadopoulos, Trump conceded that uh, U.S. and North Korean officials were at odds about the precise definition of what denuclearization is and how it should be carried out uh, in North Korea. These concessions make one point very clear that the two sides, they're worlds apart over the basic aim of the talks, which according to various U.S. officials uh, is circulating around the denuclearization of North Korea. Uh, what do you think about that? Yes, it's very, very evident that America and North Korea have diametrically opposing views. Now, the Americans want a, um, want a North Korea which does not have nuclear weapons. And of course, I want to see a world with no nuclear weapons whatsoever. However, the brutal truth is that Donald Trump and indeed his, his, pre, his predecessors never embarked on a military campaign um, against North Korea because North Korea does have nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are the ultimate guarantee of North Korea's independence and sovereignty. 
And the North Koreans are acutely aware, acutely conscious, that America has never attacked a country which has nuclear weapons. The North Koreans will look to Libya, where the Americans persuaded Muammar Gaddafi to stop with his nuclear weapons program. And what happened some years after, the Americans and their allies militarily intervened in Libya. They turned Libya into a failed state and they assassinated Muammar Gaddafi. The Americans are attempting to um, initiate a coup in Venezuela. So uh, there is no incentive for the North Koreans to give up their nuclear weapons. And at the same time, the North Koreans will be saying to themselves, well, even if we sign an agreement with Washington, will Washington stick to it? Now, the Americans have a track record of signing agreements and then walking away from them, most notably in recent times, the INF Treaty and the Iran nuclear deal. So for the North Koreans, they, they are going to have to receive from the Americans cast iron guarantees. And I don't think the Americans are going to give them those cast iron guarantees. But nonetheless, the most important thing is that there is now dialogue between Washington and Pyongyang. And whilst there is dialogue, there is always hope. Because what is the alternative? Warlike language coming from America and North Korea towards each other? A terrible war erupting on the Korean Peninsula, which would probably um, result in hundreds of thousands of civilian deaths? No. Um, even though the Americans and the North Koreans have diametrically opposing views, all that counts, in my opinion, is that they are talking. And I'm, I'm aware that some people are saying that Trump is doing this for um, ulterior motives. Well, maybe he is, but it's like in a game of football. All that matters is that the ball goes in the back of the, met, of the net. It doesn't matter how it was scored, providing the ball goes in the net, providing Trump is talking with Kim Jong-un, that is something that we should be delighted about and that is something that we should wholeheartedly support. Mr. Ortel, uh, we know that Trump was as eager as ever to demonstrate some sort of progress with North Korea. Uh, what went wrong here? Did he underestimate the North or did he probably overestimate his hand uh, in, in the negotiations? Well, as a guess, uh, he reached a conclusion that uh, whatever deal was on the table was not a deal that he could accept. Uh, and we're not in the United States at this moment in a place with North Korea where we have to accept a bad deal. So um, I, I, Donald Trump has been through many, many negotiations in business and now several in the international arena as president. Uh, and he's a skilled negotiator. Uh, in the end, uh, when I, 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 I'm trained as a negotiator as well, and in, the end, <clears throat> in the end, it's substance that matters. And the substance that matters here is when you look at the experiment in North Korea and you try to understand the economic uh, trajectory for the people, the average person in North Korea uh, since 1950, whenever it was, um, it is not a good story for the average person, for the elite. Uh, for the leader and his family and the, the military people, yes, maybe they're doing all right. But for the masses of North Koreans, not such a great story. And we have, forget the United States, around the world we have many examples of countries that have prospered as they've embraced openness, as they've embraced the rule of law, as they've uh, embraced, frankly, uh, market-based systems. So I, I hope that this is just a bump in the road. We need to appreciate that no prior president has ever gotten as far as Donald Trump has gotten in two years. And that uh, Donald Trump comes to this with, prior to 2015 with zero experience in politics. Mr. Papadopoulos, uh, last December, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said that Washington is, uh, quote, working towards the final fully verified denuclearization of North Korea as agreed to by Chairman Kim Jong-un. Now, has the U.S. been honest about where the talks with North Korea stand and the commitments that Pyongyang has made in those talks? Well, I don't know what Mr. Pompeo is basing um, his contentions on because um, I'm not aware 
of any incentive, any reason as to why the North Koreans would eliminate their nuclear weapons stockpile. I think that is quite, um, uh, that is quite an assumption on behalf of Mr. Pompeo, and I don't think that helps the, I don't think that helps in the context of negotiations between Washington and Pyongyang. I think the Americans need to take a number of decisive steps. They need to put into writing, they need to pledge that they will never launch a military offensive against North Korea. They need to stop with their military maneuvers in conjunction with their South Korean allies and their Japanese allies, which are often very close to North Korean airspace, very close to North Korean maritime waters. They need to reduce their military personnel in South Korea and in Japan. Why? Because that gives the impression to the North Korean leadership that they are being encircled and that is why the North Koreans have developed nuclear weapons that is in that that's human nature if a human being feels encircled if they feel threatened then they will take decisive action and I hear what the guest in America um, has just said um, and I certainly do applaud Donald Trump. I'm certainly no fan of Donald Trump, but then I'm no fan of any American president. But I certainly uh, wholeheartedly support Donald Trump um, having initiated meetings with Kim Jong-un. However, I don't think it helps for American commentators to um, lambast the political and economic system in North Korea. Yes, there are many problems in North Korea. Yes, there are many injustices there. But the North Koreans have also achieved um, many, many distinguished achievements. For example, in the health sector and in the education sector. We can turn it on America and say that there are 40 million Americans living in poverty. There are 28 million Americans um, living without health insurance. There is rampant crime, violent crime, across the whole of America. But I'm just, I'm simply stating or, 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 or uh, saying facts. I am not saying that there should, that anyone should lecture America or seek to bring about a political and economic change in America. That is down to the Americans to decide. But at the same time, no one should be lecturing North Korea about the benefits of a free market economy and about how awful the country is. Because yes, there are problems in North Korea, but there are also very serious problems in America. Mr. Rotel, I think one of the big questions in all of this is an issue that uh, Mr. Papadopoulos also brought up earlier, and that's whether the Trump administration can be trusted with a deal at all. We know that Trump hasn't been shy to tear up international agreements in the blink of an eye. Well, uh, I, I think uh, Mr. Papadopoulos raises some fair points. Uh, if you want to talk about Libya as one example, um, I think what the United States did under the Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton uh, foreign policy was truly atrocious. And, and, you know, you're absolutely right to raise the point of, you know, if we would do that in Libya, encourage somebody who was cooperating with the United States to, uh, to dismantle a nuclear program, you know, what's to stop us from doing the same thing in North Korea? It's a fair point. And so for that reason uh, and for other reasons, I think you're also right that any agreement that's struck with North Korea has to have milestones that can be enforced where both sides can agree to those milestones. Both sides can say that they're achievable and verify them. So I, I certainly agree with all that. On the issue of economics, though, I point you to the UNCTAD database going back to 1970 and implore you to look, take a close look at GDP broken into components comparing North Korea and the United States. An objective facts, it's a UN agency, all countries scored in the same way. Look at uh, consumption per capita in North Korea versus the United States. And it's, it's not a close comparison. Mr. Papadopoulos, so we do have to look at uh, South Korea amongst all of the stakeholders in this process. Seoul has come out and stated that the outcome of the uh, talks was uh, regrettable. How does the lack of movement in the U.S.-North Korea talks affect South Korea and the notion of peace on the Korean Peninsula? 
Well, um, in regard to relations between Seoul and Pyongyang, that is another area where I am optimistic because um, the North Korean leader and the South Korean leader have met, as we know, they have spoken subsequently, and that is also very, very important to um, bring in peace, long-term peace, to the Korean Peninsula. And I think that South Korea um, does have a crucial role to play in all of this. However, the, there has to be maturity shown by South Korean media because many of the appalling stories which the rest of the world hears about regarding what goes on in North Korea um, emanates from South Korean media. And of course, we know that much of what South Korean media says about the North is absolutely untrue. They are damn right lies. Nonetheless, there is dialogue between Pyongyang, between Pyongyang and Seoul. That is to be applauded. That is to be encouraged. And I hope that there will be subsequent meetings between the leaders of both Koreas in conjunction with subsequent meetings between Trump and Kim Jong-un. And Mr. Ortel, is the uh, peace on the Korean Peninsula hinge somewhat on the outcome of the uh, U.S.-North negotiations? Uh, in other words, will the U.S. allow a progression of peace to happen on the Korean Peninsula without itself being a part of the equation? Well, I think, you know, I, I don't speak for the United States government, but just as a citizen, I look at the situation in South Korea, in North Korea, I look at the situation in Japan and Germany, and I see the enormous financial burden that the United States is still shouldering, keeping military, uh, vast military operations uh, in those respective countries decades after either an armistice or a uh, peace agreement were signed. And I ask myself, you know, why should my children and grandchildren uh, have to shoulder this burden forever? So, of course, I think thinking Americans want to see peace, we want to see a reduction in uh, a substantial reduction in the number of troops that are deployed uh, outside our country. And uh, we remain ever hopeful that uh, Republicans and Democrats and independents will get to work to actually achieving peace responsibly. And uh, Mr. Papadopoulos in London, we have about 30 seconds for your uh, final statements uh, and closing thoughts on the issue. Well, I believe the American establishment would like to see the overthrow of, the, of North Korea so that both Koreas can be reunited and the new Korea which would emerge from that would be a client state of America. And of course, that would result in the Americans having influence in a country which shares a border with Russia, which would assist the Americans in their ongoing attempts to encircle Russia. They have encircled Russia in Eastern Europe, and they are into, into, um, um, attempting to encircle Russia um, in the Far East. So I do believe that the Americans are looking for an opportunity to overthrow the North Korean government. But as, as it currently stands, I think that is extremely unlikely, extremely unlikely, because new North Korea has nuclear weapons. Very well. Um, I'd like to thank my guest, publisher and editor of Politics First, Marcus Papadopoulos, joining us from London, and uh, thanks to writer and analyst Charles Ortel joining us from New York, and also special thanks to you, our viewers, for staying with us uh, here on Press TV's uh, debate. Join us uh, at uh, the same time, same place tomorrow night for another edition of Press TV's debate. Good night, everybody.